Our second scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. And I have um, asked a couple of friends to help me with this reading this morning. If you are watching a videotaped version of this sermon, you won't be able to see them, but just know that Ed Pembroke is going to be Cleopas and his friend, and Mindy Stewart is going to be Jesus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer from these things that enter, then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told him what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be God. to God. The time was 33 AD. The place was a dusty road just outside of Jerusalem. Two disciples trudging along, putting one foot in front of the other as they walked along a road that would take them to Emmaus. Emmaus. The city or town or village or whatever it was of Emmaus has never been identified with any degree of accuracy. Although most scholars and scripture itself place it somewhere around seven miles from Jerusalem, Others think it might be as far away as 19 miles. In the end, though, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter that we cannot pinpoint exactly where Emmaus is or was with any degree of accuracy, because what's important about Emmaus is not where it was, but what it was, or rather, what it represents, which is this. That place we go when our hope is gone. That place we go to escape. 
Think about it. Cleopas and his friend, two disciples of Jesus, had just left Jerusalem. They'd just witnessed the execution in the most painful way possible of Jesus, their spiritual leader and teacher. In a flash, it seems, the dreams on which they'd set their sights were just gone. In the span of less than a week, the certainty in which they'd wrapped their future was replaced with a bewildering cloak of confusion. Impossibly, Jesus was dead. Jesus was dead. He had died three days ago on a crude wooden cross, and with him died their hope. The kingdom of God, a kingdom of joy they were sure would be ruled by Jesus, suddenly lay in ruins. Deliverance from fear and oppression and persecution no longer seemed feasible. Any expectation they had that their future would be any different, any better than it was right now, had simply vanished. Because, impossibly, Jesus was dead. Jesus was dead. We can relate, can't we? We've all had those times in our lives when we felt like Cleopas and his friend, haven't we? Maybe you're having one of those times right now. One of those times when happiness seems but a distant dream. One of those times when fear and grief and sorrow consume you and paralyze you and make you unsure not only of where you're going, but of who you are. Times when you can't imagine a future any different than your less than optimal now. Times, in other words, when your hope, like that of Cleopas and his friend, has simply vanished. So you decide, like Cleopas and his friend decided, to go to Emmaus. Emmaus, that place where you go to get away from Jerusalem, that place where your hope has died. Emmaus, that place where you go to seek solace. Emmaus, that place where you go not only to grieve your loss of hope, but to forget your loss of hope as completely as you possibly can. Presbyterian pastor and theologian Frederick Beekner describes Emmaus like this. Emmaus is any place we go in order to escape a bar, a movie, wherever it is, we throw up our hands and say, let the whole damned thing go hang. It makes no difference anyway. Emmaus may be buying a new suit or a new car or smoking more cigarettes than you really want. Emmaus is whatever we do or wherever we go to make ourselves forget that the world holds nothing sacred. Emmaus, in other words, is wherever we go to get away from it all, when all gets to be just too much. Where's your Emmaus? Where do you go to forget? When life gets too much for you, where is it that you go? Is your Emmaus, as Frederick Beekner suggests, a place where you drown your sorrows? Or is it a place where you indulge in desserts you know you should pass up? Does your Emmaus consist of a series of shopping malls where you go to buy things you can't afford, but which you buy anyway, just because it makes you, for the moment anyway, feel better? Or is your Emmaus a place of activity a place where you fill every waking moment of every single day with work and things to do. Things for your family, things for your community, even things for your church. Anything and everything you can think of to fill your time so you don't have to think about your loss of hope, so that you don't have to remember that you're on the road to Emmaus. 
we all, all of us, have a place we go to get out of Jerusalem, that place where hope has died. We all, all of us, have an Emmaus. And so did Cleopas and his friend, because Emmaus was where they were headed that day, on that dusty road, three days after Jesus' crucifixion. As they walked, though, as they were putting one foot in front of the other, as they sought to leave Jerusalem behind, as they walked on their way to Emmaus, they met a stranger, a stranger who, incredibly as it seemed, knew nothing about what had happened. He had to have been living in a vacuum, they thought, to not know about Jesus, to not know that Jesus had been handed over to the chief priests and condemned to die, to not know that Jesus had, in fact, been crucified, to not know that Jesus' body was missing from the tomb, to not know that angels, of all things, had told them that Jesus was no longer dead, but instead was very much alive somehow. And so they told the stranger all these things, all these things that had happened, expecting, no doubt, that the stranger would be just as shocked and appalled and bereft of hope as they now were as they walked that dusty road to Emmaus. But the stranger was not shocked and appalled at their news, as they'd surely thought he would be. He seemed instead shocked and appalled at them. Did they not understand, he asked them, what it all meant? Could they not see that what had happened was only what the prophets had been saying would happen for the past, oh, thousand years or so? Were they so slow of heart, so lacking in faith, that they could not realize that Jesus was the Messiah? And so, as they seemed not to understand these things, he began to explain it to them. He started right at the beginning with Moses. He moved right on through the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all the rest. And then finally, he finished up with current events. The day grew long, and soon the travelers found themselves at the outskirts of Emmaus, at the city limits, as it were. And so they stopped for the night. And, according to the hospitality traditions of the day, they invited this stranger to stay with them. The stranger accepted their invitation, so they settled in for the evening, prepared a simple meal, and sat down to share it together. And then the most amazing thing happened. This stranger, their guest, took the bread he'd just been offered, and then just as if he were the host and not the guest, he said grace. He thanked God for the meal they were about to eat, and, they gave, and he gave them the bread to eat, and they ate it. And then all of a sudden, in a blinding flash of revelation, their eyes were opened, and they realized who he was. The stranger who sat at their table, the stranger who had appeared out of nowhere, this stranger who knew things he had no way of knowing, this stranger was no stranger at all. This stranger was the risen Christ. Jesus Christ, whom they'd thought was dead, wasn't dead at all. He had risen. I think Cleopas and his friend knew right then and there that they'd never make it to Emmaus, that place they were going to get away from Jerusalem that place where they were going to seek solace, that place they were going to forget the loss of hope they thought had died that day with Jesus. They'd never make it to Emmaus because now they didn't have to go to Emmaus because now they weren't hopeless anymore. Their hope hadn't died after all. Their hope instead was sitting right there at the table with them eating dinner with them as if it were the most natural thing in the world. Their hope had been returned to them that day on the dusty road to Emmaus in the person of Jesus Christ. 
It's like that for us too, you know, that Christ comes to us when we're walking our road to Emmaus, that place we go when life gets to be too much for us, that place we go to get away from it all, that place we go when we feel hopeless. Because it's there on that road, that road where we've given up hope, that road where expectations fail us, that road where we finally, finally have just given up, period. It's there on that road that Christ finds us. It's there that Christ opens our eyes. It's there that Christ burns in our hearts, that point at which we're the most broken, the most vulnerable, the most despondent. That's where Christ finds us. That's where Christ reveals himself to us. Because that's where we've acknowledged, not only to ourselves, but also to him, that we can't make it alone, that we're not invincible, that we need help. We all, all of us, have a place to go to escape Jerusalem, that place where hope has died. We all, all of us, have an Emmaus, that place we go to forget this. And we all, all of us, travel to Emmaus at one time or another in our lives, trudging along, putting one foot in front of the other as we walk that dusty road. Times when happiness seems but a distant dream, times when fear and grief and sorrow consume us and paralyze us and make us unsure not only where we're going, but of who we are. Times when we just can't imagine a future any different than our less than optimal now. Thankfully though, we all, all of us, also have Jesus Christ, who meets us on our road to Emmaus appearing in the most surprising of ways and when we least expect him, that's where Christ rises up and meets us, bringing with him the hope that we can't find on our own, the hope we thought had died, the hope we thought we'd never see again. That's where Christ rises up to meet us, on the dusty road to Emmaus. That's where we encounter the risen Christ. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we come to you today broken, vulnerable, and for some of us, despondent. We come to you this morning understanding all too well the hopelessness of Cleopas and his friend that day. That day they walked to Emmaus because we have felt that way as well, hopeless. We felt as they did, dejected, demoralized, discouraged, and despairing. We have felt as they did, the seeming pointlessness of life, the frustration of trying to no avail, the futility of trying again and again and again and getting nowhere. And so we come to you today giving thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ, who by the power of the Holy Spirit enters our lives at just these times, bringing the hope we thought was gone forever, the hope we need to carry on, the hope we know is hope realized in the person of the resurrected Christ. Because we know that the resurrected Christ is you, come to us in human form as the gift of Easter, your promise that this hope is ours not only today, but forever. Amen.